Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And this episode is brought to you by Artemisia Publishing. They not only publish award winning dinosaur books, but also coloring puzzles, which can be put together and then colored using markers, crayons, or colored pencils. You can get more information at apbooks.net. This week, we have the dinosaur of the day, Rugops, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. Before we get into that, we just want to give a shout out to our patrons on Patreon, Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, and the Georges family. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you so much, and you really help us keep this podcast going. If you'd like to join this awesome group of people, then check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yeah. So jumping right into the news, thanks to Eli, Kessler, Charles, Vic, Chris, Luke, and Antonio. <laughs> Through Slack, Twitter, and Facebook in all kinds of ways. And text messages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for sending us this one, it was the most popular dinosaur story I've seen possibly all year. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. If you're not guessing what it is, it's the, quote, first non-avialin theropod fragment preserved in amber, end quote. At least that's the technical name for it. To everybody on the internet, it's just dinosaur tail in amber. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> get the gist. possibly feathered dinosaur tail in amber. And soft tissue. Yeah. Soft tissue is cool, too. So, getting a little bit deeper into it, the specimen is named DIPV15103, but it's nicknamed Ava after Ava Kopelhus, who is Philip Curry's wife, and we got a chance to meet her. She goes on all the digs with Phil Curry, generally, yep. and he was one of the co-authors on the paper about this dinosaur tale. Really great couple, and we ran into them a lot at SVP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're a lot of fun. You may remember back in July, we also covered a discovery of two dinosaur wings that were preserved in amber from the mid-Cretaceous, and those are considered avialin because they appear to be from flying dinosaurs, and avialin basically just means bird-like. So the same researchers discovered this tail as discovered those wings, and the tail is also covered with a lot of feathers, just like those wings were. But in this case, the feathers are more like a soft down than a stiff feather that you would need for flying. And combining that with other details led the researchers to believe that this dinosaur probably didn't fly. So since it's from the same site in Myanmar called Angbamo, the wings and tail are both from the same time period, which is about 99 million years ago, or like I said, pretty much in the middle of the Cretaceous. Unfortunately, similar to the wings, which were only preserved near the end of the wing, there were, you know, the lower part of the wing wasn't preserved. This dinosaur tail only preserved a portion of it as well, and it's probably the middle of the tail, it looks like. Based on its condition, they believe that, quote, either the tail bearer was dead and partially desiccated before encapsulation, or else it rapidly dried due to resin interactions, end quote. And that ended up giving it a mummified appearance, which is basically like a really dried out appearance, just like a mummy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the piece was already being prepared as jewelry, so there is an unknown section that was removed. Can you imagine if it ended up being a piece of jewelry? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there are dinosaurs in amber that have been turned into jewelry, since that's mostly what they do with this stuff. And the only reason it didn't was because there were researchers there that noticed it. Yeah, it's so crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not great. But on the bright side, the mistake of cutting into it a little bit exposed a portion of the fossil so that it could be chemically tested. And the researchers found that there was significant evidence of hemoglobin in the tail, and they found other soft tissue under the feathers using a synchrotron micro CT scanner. They think the soft tissue includes skin, muscles, and ligaments, but most of the tissue has, quote, 
been reduced to a carbon film, retaining only traces of the original chemical composition, end quote. So that's kind of the mummification that we were talking about. Things get pretty dried out and then sort of decayed, but, you know, just kind of changed chemically. It's likely that even before part of the tail was removed in preparation, that a portion of the tail was poking out of the amber, and that would have allowed minerals in the surrounding rock to get into the specimen. And when they did the chemical analysis of the specimen, it did look like the surrounding rock had kind of started to fossilize into it. So this meant that the chemistry between the feathers and the bones of the tail are similar, and that's problematic when you try to do a CT scan because that relies on differences in the chemistry. So you have to be a lot more careful and there's a lot more manual work that goes on there. Fortunately, two of the vertebrae were exposed from the rest of the tail. So they estimated that this part of the tail is composed of about eight vertebrae. I think the main reason that this got so much news is because of Jurassic Park and also Jurassic World, since you know, dinosaurs in amber is really exciting. And the wings, you know, were a little bit bird-like, so people weren't as thrilled about that. Although I still kind of think that might be cooler. We won't be cloning dinosaurs from this, but it does tell us something about the theropod to bird transition, because like I said, it's definitely a non-avian dinosaur tail. And it also shows us some cool things about how the feathers were evolving since they were missing that strong structure of a flight feather. It's kind of got like a, a core to it. Like if you imagine a quill that you're using to write with, if you've ever written with a feather. <laughs> as many of us have. <laughs> I think I did as a kid, or maybe I just tried to. Yeah. But they've got that, you know, like kind of pen shape thing in the middle of it. It's hollow. This didn't have that. It was just more like almost like a fern or something where it's just kind of fuzzy sticking out all yeah, downy the pictures of it are really cool and they look it looks fuzzy yeah in the amber yeah exactly it's crazy and i think at least one of the articles mentioned that they're pretty sure it's of a juvenile tail mm. and possibly a salurosaur or some yeah. kind of theropod yeah they did talk about salurosaurs a little bit that's a little bit it's kind of hard to tell because the feathers are kind of blocking the bones in the tail so it's hard to see the vertebrae, and, you know, obviously the main thing we know about most dinosaurs is their bones, not their feathers, so the feathers don't give you a lot of information about which dinosaur it was. Yet. Maybe we'll keep finding these. Yeah. And at the same time as the wings and the tail, they apparently also found nine other pieces of amber, and I don't think those have been published yet, so maybe there's some other exciting stuff coming out. And one of the authors also said that they think it's possible to find a complete dinosaur encased in amber. That would be amazing. I was trying to imagine a tree that would have that much sap, though. That seems crazy. Maybe a small dinosaur. Yeah. Or a juvenile. Yeah, like an embryo just hatched and then got covered or something. I guess it's possible. It'd be crazy if like, it's the amber covered it and its face was making some sort of expression. Yeah. <laughs> that got caught in that or frozen yeah. like that. Yeah, that'd be creepy. <laughs> it would tell us a lot. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, there's a new article talking about the Augustina ligabuei, which was originally described as something kind of like an Amargosaurus, except with extra armor. And it was believed to have a long row of spines sticking out of its neck, back, and tail, but this new article by Flavio Bayardini and Ignacio Cerda kind of examined that because it's not necessarily the best assumption. So when it was originally found, they assumed that some of the bones were those spines sticking out of the back and that others were osteoderms that would have armored its back, making it kind of like a hybrid between an ankylosaur and a sauropod, which would be really cool. So it's pretty popular. But over the last few years, there have been some doubts about whether the bones that were found were in fact spines and osteoderms. So recently, this group looked at the structure of the bones, and they believe that instead of spines and osteoderms, they are more likely parts of ribs and hips. That's much less exciting. Yeah. And part of the problem is that the bones are really poorly preserved, so it's difficult to analyze. 
But at the end of the day, it's looking like we have one less dinosaur with armor. And that's not as exciting because I love a good armored dinosaur. <laughs> Me too. It's better to know the truth. Yeah. And the spiny titanosaurs are really cool too. Mm hmm. Next, just a quick note about an early marsupial relative called Didolophodon vorax. It may have been a predator to dinosaurs. This is according to Live Science. So it lived at the end of the Mesozoic in what is now Montana, North Dakota, and it had a strong bite force. More force pound for pound than a hyena, apparently. That's a lot. Hyenas have some of the strongest bite forces. Yeah. And it was an omnivore, so it's definitely plausible that it could have eaten small dinosaurs. Yeesh. Just the reason we note it here. Yeah. And also to show, like, dinosaurs weren't always the most dominant of their time. And also they weren't the only things. People often think of the Mesozoic as just dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. You know, there were big dinosaurs and little dinosaurs and medium dinosaurs, and flying dinosaurs, even though a lot of the things that were flying weren't dinosaurs. But, <laughs> yeah, there were marsupials and other mammals and all sorts of things running around. Next up, there's a new finding by the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project and specifically, they're trying to explain some of the overlapping ceratopsians that have been seen in southern Alberta and northern Montana. So they believe that many of the ceratopsians represent two distinct groups that probably ate different things and therefore didn't compete for food. So technically, the two groups are subclads within Centrosaurinae. And we've talked before about the difference between Centrosaurinae and Chasmosaurinae, but this is kind of a further <laughs> separation within Centrosaurinae. So the two subclads are Nasutoceratops, which had less ornamentation along its frill, a smaller nasal horn, and then had larger horns above its eyes. So kind of like a Triceratops that way. It's kind of got that general body plan going on. Then there's Centrosaurinae, and that had lots of ornamentation around the edge of its frill, but shorter horns above its eyes. So kind of more like a typical centrosaurine. And interestingly, the researchers also note that there are differences in their jaws as well, which may be evidence for them eating different types of food and therefore filling different niches. So one was eating one thing and the other was eating something else, and therefore you might find them in the same place and they weren't just out competing each other all the time. And a couple weeks ago when we talked to Sean Gulick, we asked him if they had found any iridium in the core samples that they pulled from the Chicxulub crater. And as a quick reminder, there's this layer of iridium all over the Earth between the Cretaceous and Paleogene at that KT boundary or KPG boundary. And it's a really good indicator that a meteor hit then because iridium is super rare on Earth and the assumption is that the meteorite had iridium in it and then when it poofed all that debris all over the Earth, it left this really convenient layer there so you can see exactly where the boundary is and it makes it really easy to date things. So you'd expect that if you drill directly into the Chicxulub crater, you'd find a bunch of iridium because we think that was where the iridium came from. But the BBC is reporting that they still haven't found any iridium from those core samples. Fortunately, they did find a lot of nickel, which binds to iron in a similar way to iridium, so they think that that's a good sign. Doesn't prove anything yet, though. Yeah, and the four labs that got samples weeks ago are apparently still looking, so we just have to keep waiting and hope that they can show that there's extra iridium in this crater than there is in the rest of the KT boundary layer. But there is still a chance that they won't find that much more iridium because they were drilling into the peak ring, which isn't really where the impactor hit, so there might not actually be that much meteorite material right there. It might have, you know, vaporized or gone down right in the center of the crater. It's hard to say exactly where that material ended up, but it's hard to say. Interesting. I'm sure we'll be learning a lot more over the next few months or even years. Yeah, while they go through them and look for different bacteria and all sorts of things like that. Mm -hmm. Next, in time for the holidays, The Guardian shared how you can tell that the turkey you eat 
at Christmas dinner, because that's the traditional meal in the UK, is a dinosaur. Though you probably won't have access to the head, the neck, or the feet, you can still take a good look at the wishbone, also known as the furcula. Both modern birds and dinosaurs had this, and there have been some tyrannosauruses found with a furcula, though it looked slightly different. Yeah, not all dinosaurs had those things, though, because they were kind of later evolutions, but yeah, some did. Yeah, but then that makes sense if they eventually evolved into birds. Sure. (laughs) And turkeys, (laughs) specifically. (laughs) So... Turkeys also have a large breastbone, similar to dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor and Microraptor. And if you boil your turkey for soup, you'll see the rib cage, where the ribs have this curved rod extension, similar to some dinosaurs, like Velociraptor. And you may also notice the turkey's air-filled bones, so it's a pretty fun way to make connections between birds and dinosaurs. Yeah, I always notice that kind of stuff now, too. Although... They mentioned that you don't have access to the neck or the feet, and those are two of the places where you actually see it the most, especially the feet. Yeah, well, depends how you prepare your turkey. It's true, if you go get a fresh bird. But I'm sure most people will have a headless, neckless. Well, maybe footless might have a neck. Yeah, they do often give you the neck, at least in the U.S. (laughs) (laughs) Not the feet, though. I've never seen a turkey's feet. I've seen chicken feet. Yeah, and those are usually sold separately. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> feet sold separately next in Lyon, france an allosaurus skeleton sold at auction for 1.1 million euros according to the guardian the allosaurus is nicknamed can and was discovered in 2013 in the morrison formation it's about 25 feet or seven and a half meters long and a nearly complete skeleton the person who bought the skeleton is french and so cam will stay in france and be put on public display at some point in some yet-to-be-announced location. (laughs) Apparently, the new owner wants it to be a surprise. (laughs) That's funny. I hope it stays permanently on public display. That would be really nice. Yeah, it would be. Maybe that's part of the surprise. (laughs) (laughs) They should put it in front of the Louvre or something. That's what I was hoping. (laughs) Or in the Louvre. I don't don't know how feasible that is, but that would be pretty awesome. The Louvre is really big, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just get a couple of those paintings out of there. Well... Yeah, I don't know how feasible that is. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking for different things going I guess to so. that museum. <laughs> Speaking of auctions, there was a dinosaur statue in Milwaukee that sold for just $11, according to Milwaukee Record. So just a little different from the price of the Allosaurus skeleton. Mm. The statue belonged to Johnson's Park, which used to have two mini golf courses, a go-kart track, bumper cars, batting cages, a water slide, and an arcade to go along with its large ceramic statues. And between November 23rd and December 6th, the owner auctioned off items, including the dinosaur statue. The statue is about 15 feet tall, and it looks pretty dated. It's a the T-Rex-looking statue with a dragging tail, though it's kind of funny because it looks like it's using a bone as a cane. <laughs> like a old Barney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but not purple. <laughs> so the statue sold for 11 bucks, and Milwaukee Record offered to buy it off the new owner for $20 in cash. I don't know mm. how serious they were. Did you ever go there as a kid, Garrett? Nope. Yeah, it's too bad. I don't think so, at least. Johnson's Park? Yeah, you probably would have remembered this dinosaur statue. Yeah. Next, according to Manawatu Standard, you can spend a night with dinosaurs at the Te Manawa Museum in New Zealand. The museum has a dinosaur exhibit up until February. I'm pretty sure we've mentioned it before. And they wanted to allow as many people as possible to see it. So they hosted a dinosaur sleepover on December 10th. Only 40 people were allowed to attend, children ages 8 to 11, accompanied by adults. And it costs $25 per person. Because of the popularity, they're doing it again on January 14th. So if you live nearby, you should get tickets and then tell us how awesome it is. Yeah, that sounds fun. Maybe one of these days a museum near us will have a sleepover <laughs> with dinosaurs. Actually, no museums near us have dinosaurs. so it's The normal. Berkeley Museum has some. Yeah, but they're only open once a year. They could have a sleepover. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 
Next, Dinosaur Isle in the UK is getting funding by the Royal Society, which they're using to teach visitors about Rev Fox, who's a dinosaur hunter who lived from 1813 to 1881. This is according to Island Echo. Rev Fox collected over 500 dinosaur bones, and when he died, the Natural History Museum in London acquired his collection. And according to the article, Rev Fox has more dinosaur species named after him than any other Englishman. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Dinosaur Isle is going to have a trail, guided walks, and they'll be showcasing some of Fox's fossils. That always sounds like a cool place to go. Yep. On our ever-growing list. (laughs) Yep. Next, the paleontologist Phil Curry, husband of Ava, who they nicknamed the Dinosaur Amber Tail after. Anyway, Phil Curry was awarded the Governor General's Meritorious Service Cross on December 8th. Meritorious. That's a fun word. (laughs) Yes. This is according to the University of Alberta. So he won the award for using CT scanners to create 3D models of fossils to study the biomechanics, growth, and physiology of dinosaurs. Cool. Which I was impressed when we were at SVP, the amount of tech that paleontologists are using to study dinosaurs. Yeah. Next up, there's another dinosaur-ish game coming out for mobile devices. It's called Morphite, and it looks really similar to No Man's Sky, which disappointed a lot of gamers. I remember on Reddit there were a lot of people demanding refunds and then getting refunds, and they people were charting the number of users like plummeting. But just like No Man's Sky, in this game, you're really selling it. <laughs> yeah. You pilot a spaceship and explore different worlds populated by new exciting animals. And that was really the big promise of No Man's Sky. There were other things that people were looking for in No Man's Sky, too, like epic battles in space and fancy landing sequences and things. This one seems to be, you know, underselling it possibly to prevent that from happening because they say you basically just teleport down to the planet and you know it's it's a little more simple mechanic but hopefully it does a better job at creating exciting animals some of the in-game footage does show dinosaurs with a very concavenator like creature in one screenshot so i have hope for dinosaurs although considering no man's sky came up with some pretty awful looking animals this whole infinite exploring universe style of game <laughs> may not come up with the most exciting animals. It's hard to say. Well, in the screenshot I saw, it looked like kind of colorful origami-ish. Yeah. Well, that's what No Man's Sky looked like too. Oh, really? But hopefully, I mean, maybe they haven't released that much information about it and they haven't given the same description with No Man's Sky where they were saying like, there's billions of planets and you'll never run out of new things to explore. So maybe there's just like 50 planets and then they can make them all really cool manually rather than relying on some algorithm that doesn't work very well. But anyway, we'll find out in early 2017 when it comes out. (laughs) Next in the news, Cracked has a funny list of, quote, silly rules that old dinosaur movies all seem to follow, end quote. I think the best one in the list is the greatest enemy of the T-Rex is the vehicle. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good one. Because it's very true. There's always people in a car and then the car is getting attacked by a t-rex and if you imagine like an actual animal like say just on a safari if you drive by a lion or something they're usually just kind of befuddled by what a car is and if anything they'll either kind of run up and poke at it a little bit to try to figure out what it is or just run away or completely ignore it but they don't think of it as like food, so they're not chewing on it. It doesn't really make any sense. And it doesn't seem like these animals are trying to get at the people inside either, the way T-Rex always seems to in movies. <laughs> I liked the one about long-necked animals seem to have survived or live on or something. Yeah, I think that it was pretty similar to another one where they said dinosaurs can be found anywhere. And yeah, it's like usually on an island or in the case of the long neck dinosaurs, I think they were really talking about marine reptiles more than anything like Nessie and things like that. Mm. And then there was also the Dinosaur Project movie that I think we talked about before where there are just a bunch of dinosaurs in Africa somewhere that somehow nobody noticed. Yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty goofy one. 
And then one other funny one was that people are usually eaten by things you least expect. <laughs> and I think that's not really true because usually they're getting eaten by like T-Rex or big carnivores. But then occasionally there's something like in the second Jurassic Park where they were getting eaten by the tiny Compsognathus. And in the first one where Nedry gets attacked by the venom spitting Dilophosaurus. <laughs> and he was pretty surprised by that. So it's a kind of funny list. Yeah, it is. Makes a couple good points. Entertaining. <laughs> yeah. In the people are usually eaten by things you least expect. I think the image that goes along with this is this giant tortoise looking thing. Yeah. Not even remotely a dinosaur. <laughs> no, but probably from an old movie that had a dinosaur in it. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> And last in the news, in New Zealand, the Making Movies film crew is shooting a TV documentary called Modern Dinosaurs, which will air in 2018, according to Scoop. It's a six-part series that will be on the Discovery Channel, and it will show animals unique to New Zealand, as well as dinosaurs that live there and other prehistoric creatures like mosasaurs and ammonites. And the documentary takes place at the Mangataniwa Native Forest. So it'll be interesting to see their take on this, I wonder if there'll be any like cgi of dinosaurs or anything like that probably seems to work its way into just about every dinosaur documentary these days <laughs> uh, walking with dinosaurs was good and that had puppets too the bbc one mm -hmm. the, oh okay some of them were puppets i didn't realize before we get into the dinosaur of the day we have another word from our sponsor artemisia publishing and we want to point out that it is winter time so you have to find fun things to do indoors, especially if you're not in California where the weather's always wonderful. <laughs> and one thing that Sabrina and I like to do because we don't necessarily live the youngest, most exciting lifestyle is puzzles. Hey, 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 speak for yourself. <laughs> puzzles are very exciting. I actually really love puzzles. And the coloring puzzles that Artemisia Publishing makes are really cool. Even though they don't have that many pieces, they still will take quite a while to make because you get to color them in afterwards. So you could have a full fun day of dinosaur puzzling and then coloring. Yeah, good family activity. It is, yeah. And like I said, I think the puzzles, the one we have is 100 pieces. I think the other ones are 100 pieces as well. So that's a, a good number for kids to get through and then... Since it's a coloring puzzle and you can use anything from crayons to colored pencils and markers, you know, you could give it to any kid basically because what kid doesn't know how to color with crayons? You pick that skill up pretty early on or you can make a much more intricate one if you're artistic, more artistic than me probably. Give it some patterns. Yeah. I think Sabrina is going to be in charge of coloring in ours because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ruin it. And then it's small enough, you could easily frame it. Yeah, definitely. Get some puzzle glue, throw that bad boy up on the wall. Mm -hmm. We've been known to do that too. <laughs> yep. And then Artemisia also has the dinosaur activity book and a dinosaur coloring book if you're not interested in putting together a puzzle before you start coloring. Although I don't know why you wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly the puzzle is a great part of the project. At the very least, it's a good holiday gift. Yep. And pretty inexpensive, too. Yeah, they're definitely reasonably priced. And if you want more information on the books or the coloring puzzle, head over to apbooks.net or get the link for the coloring puzzle off of our show notes because that one's a little bit longer. And enjoy. <laughs> yep. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Rugops, which was a request from Cole via Patreon. So thanks, Cole. The name means wrinkle face, which <laughs> makes me think of a very a wizened dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> it's a theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Africa. It was discovered in 2000 in Niger by Paul Serrano and a team and was a big breakthrough in knowing how theropods evolved in Africa, and it was named in 2004. The type species is Rugops primus, which means first wrinkle face. <laughs> So only a skull has been found, but it was first estimated to be 20 feet or 6 meters long based on comparisons to relatives. It's now estimated to be 14 feet or 4.4 meters long. The ever-shrinking dinosaur phenomenon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the skull had arteries and veins, which is what gave it this wrinkled appearance. 
and the blood vessels may have given Rugops some display features not seen in other theropods that may have made it look scarier or more threatening, or maybe it allowed it to blush in its snout. Hmm. Which, I mean, we've talked before about, like, stegosaurus could blush and ankylosaurus could blush, or maybe ceratopsians or and the stegosaurus in the plates. But it's interesting to think of a carnivorous dinosaur blushing. Mm-hmm. And what do they have to be embarrassed about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's that kind of blushing. I know. So the skull had two rows of seven holes, which may have been spots for a crest or horns, though it's unknown for sure. And the skulls had scales on it, this kind of armor. And Paul Serrano said it may be a scavenger. Quote, it's not the kind of head designed for fighting or bone crushing, end quote. And Rugops is in a abelosaurid, which they tend to have weaker bite forces, and Rugops' teeth seem to be weaker than other abelosaurids. It probably had short arms, which would have helped balance its large head. It was the first abelosaurid found in Africa. Other abelosaurids have been found in South America and India, and Rugops shows that South America, India, and Africa were once connected. Before Rugops, scientists thought that Africa had split off from Gondwana much earlier, like 120 million years. Now they think it didn't drift apart until 95 to 100 million years ago. You can see Rugops in the first episode of Planet Dinosaur, which is the BBC series, and it's depicted as a scavenger. And you can also see it in Monsters Resurrected, which is a Discovery Channel series. Rugops was one of the species whose DNA was used to create Indominus Rex in Jurassic World as well, so you can... Kind really? of see traits of it, I guess. Yeah. So Rugops was an abelosaur, and abelosauridae means Abel's lizards. It's a clad of ceratosaurian theropods that lived in the Jurassic and Cretaceous in Gondwana, so Africa, South America, India, and Madagascar. And Jose Bonaparte and Fernando Novas named it in 1985 when they described abelosaurus, which was named after Roberto Abel, who discovered it. It was bipedal and carnivorous, and it had short hind limbs and ornamentation on the skull bones, and the skulls were generally tall and shallow. It had four digits on the hands, and they were also part of the group Ceratosaurs. And our fun fact of the day is that the Jurassic World sequel won't be coming out until 2018, probably a well-known fact, but there are at least eight dinosaur-related movies scheduled for next year. And I was surprised that there were eight. There's quite a few. So there's My Pet Dinosaur, which actually looks like it might be kind of cool. Thugs vs. Dinosaurs, Iron Sky, The Coming Race, Absolution, My Jurassic Place, Dino Knots, Z-Rex, The Jurassic Dead, and hopefully Kong Skull Island, assuming that they have dinosaurs in it. I had no idea there were that many. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You think even more will come out in 2018? Could be, yeah. There are other ones that are planned and already announced for 2018, but it looks like a lot of movies that are announced for that far in the future end up not really coming to pass, so I tried to narrow it down to ones that looked like would actually happen. (laughs) Sure. Well, things to look forward to. Yep. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you are a big dinosaur enthusiast and enjoy listening to our podcasts, then join our community on Patreon at patreon.com slash I know dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.